This is going to be a great topic. We're going to talk about hospital-acquired infectious disease. My name is Terry Shenfield. This lecture is going to speak to what the CDC findings are on most nosocomial infections reported. I feel this is a great topic when you talk about bacteria. Bacteria have been around for billions of years, and there are probably more bacteria on Earth than any other kind of organism. These organisms are not all pathogenic. Many of them are very helpful to humans. For example, the bacteria that lines our GI system helps our immunity and helps break down foods. Also, there are many other foods that are made with bacteria, for example, cheese and yogurt. The ones we're really concerned about are the pathogenic bacteria. These type of organisms can wreak havoc in the body. In today's presentation, we have certain objectives. Nosocomial infections are infections that you acquire during a hospital stay. So you come in for a hip replacement and you end up getting a pneumonia. The CDC has listed certain organisms that have been a problem in most hospitals. Modes of transmission speaks to the fact that many of these bugs get transferred from one patient to another, from one ward to another. You cannot forget about antibiotic-resistant nosocomial pathogens, which represent the worst of the worst. And finally, we will speak about the control of these nosocomial infections in the hospital. When you think about nosocomial infections, this is an infection that is caused during your hospital stay. You don't come in with this infection. Another word for a nosocomial infection is a hospital-acquired infection. Many patients who come into the hospital have been diagnosed with some of these infections and they'll be treated appropriately. But many patients come into the hospital and they are asymptomatic, but they are colonized with some very bad bugs. A lot of times these bugs can be transferred to another healthcare worker who indirectly infects a patient. Family members come in to visit patients and a lot of times infection control practices are broken. How many family members have you seen sit around in a patient's room with shorts on and a t-shirt while meanwhile we gown up in a yellow gown? When you think about antibiotic research, many pharmaceutical companies are not investing any kind of money into antibiotic research because as soon as they come up with a brand new antibiotic, there are resistant organisms to that antibiotic. Pharmaceutical companies spend millions of dollars for research and spend an elaborate amount of time to get a product to market, only to find that the product is no good no more. Nosocomial infections represent 5 to 10% of all infection rates in the United States. And in some developing countries, these nosocomial infections could be greater than 40%. I cannot tell you how much money this all cost. When you think about the expenses involved with nosocomial infections, they say that approximately 2 million patients will get some form of hospital-acquired infections, and nearly 90,000 of them will die. The overall direct cost of hospital-acquired infections to hospitals could be anywhere from $28 billion to $45 billion. While the range is wide, Hospital-acquired infections is clearly very expensive. In addition, most hospital-acquired infections are preventable. We still have laps in our infection control policies, and this results in patients getting sick. There are many different types of nosocomial infections, but the CDC has classified 13 types of nosocomial infections based upon their biological and clinical data. Of all those infections that occur, urinary tract infections account for up to 40% of all hospital-acquired infections. The associated mortality and morbidity of this is a major drain to hospital resources. Patients with indwelling urinary catheters are really susceptible to these type of infections, especially the elderly male patients. The organisms responsible typically originate from the intestinal flora, but occasionally it could be from other sources. 
Another big problem with this is that most of these urinary tract in infections can be resistant organisms, which makes it very difficult to treat. Another cause of infections is surgical sites. Many times patients come in for some kind of surgical procedure and end up walking away with an infection. Gastroenteritis, meningitis, and respiratory infections are the common types of infections we see in a hospital setting. Something you may not think about is that a lot of patients are on chemotherapy or they have organ transplants or they could be HIV positive. When these patients get sick, the treatment options are really low. Also, their immunity is very low. The bad news is that hospital-inquired infections have increased from 17 to 30% in the last five years. We really got to do something to prevent this happening in the future. There are many types of nosocomial infections in the world. And when you think about it, there are many different types of organisms. We have protozoas, we have fungi, we have viruses, we have mycobacteria, but of all of them, the bacteria species is the one that really impacts the most with nosocomial infections. Bacterial infections account for over 90% of all illnesses in this nation and throughout the world. The CDC concerns itself with four different types of species. One is called the Enterococci, the other is Pseudomonas, the other one is Staphylococcus and finally E. coli. All of these represent a real problem in healthcare today. I want to tell you a little about all these organisms. Enterococci are gram-positive organisms. They cause a variety of illnesses such as endocarditis, urinary tract infection, cellulitis, and wound infection. There are approximately 17 different species within this family, and most of them cause harm to humans. A pseudomonas infection normally occurs in the hospital, especially with those with a weakened immune system. You can have infections of the blood, you could also have a pneumonia, and you could also have an infection post-surgical. Many people don't get sick with pseudomonas outside of the hospital, but if you do, you might end up getting an ear infection or some kind of skin rash. Most of the time, pseudomonas love moist, warm areas. Another common infection is a staph infection. Staphylococcus aureus is a bacteria that is gram positive. Many times it's attributed to skin infections such as pimples and scratches on the skin. But anytime the skin comes in contact with chest tubes, urinary catheters, and central lines, these can cause staph infections that are internal in the bloodstream. These infections are mostly caused by contact, skin to skin, from a doctor or from a nurse, and they can cause some severe infections, especially if you end up getting MRSA infection. And finally, we talk about E. coli. E. coli is a rod-shaped gram-negative bacteria that is normally part of your intestinal tract. A lot of times, E. coli can be transmitted from one patient to another through dirty bed sheets. E. coli can cause a host of infections that are caused by contamination of food products that you eat in the hospital, as well as from one healthcare worker to another. I was talking about the four most common bacteria that the hospital sees, but there are many others. For example, we have a Cenobacter. When you talk about a Cenobacter, you really should be talking about a Cenobacter bomani. This is the most common pathogen in the Cenobacter family, and it causes many different types of nosocomial infection. Four very common types of disabilities you could get from a Cenobacter is pneumonia, especially ventilator-associated pneumonia. You could get meningitis, 
and you could also get necrotizing fasciitis, and finally with urinary tract infections, with Acinobacter as being the culprit for all of them. Acinobacter has been labeled by the CDC as a superbug, meaning that there are many resistant strains that antibiotics don't work very well with. Another common pathogen is C. diff. C. diff is caused by the overuse of antibiotics. When a patient gets C. C. diff, they end up getting bad cases of diarrhea. And at this time, it could be spread from one patient to another. Moist bed sheets can cause a real problem for healthcare workers who can transmit this to other patients. C. diff is very, very contagious. CRE or carbapenem resistant endobacteriae is another very bad resistant organism found in the hospital. Carbapenems are bactericidal beta-lactam antimicrobials. This is a very common antibiotic used for severe infections, but this species have found a resistance to this type of antibiotic. Mostly, this occurs in nursing homes, and a lot of times the patients who are admitted to the hospital end up being colonized with this type of bacteria. Another bad bug out there is Klebsiella pneumonia. This is a gram-negative bacteria that causes different types of health-associated infections, such as pneumonia, bloodstream infections, wound and surgical side infections, as well as meningitis. Klebsiella pneumonia has been causing a lot of problems with ventilated patients. Basically, this type of bacteria is resistant to carbapenems, as we mentioned before. We couldn't complete our talk unless we talked about MRSA. MRSA is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. That means that this particular species is resistant to many different types of bacteria. And again, the CDC has classified this as a superbug. Common methods of transmission of this bug is through hands of healthcare workers. Many times, healthcare workers have contaminated hands or contaminated equipment that could be spread from one patient to another, and that's why PPE is very, very important. I know I didn't mention all of the bugs on this list, but I did mention the bugs that are most a problem. Bacteria need a way to survive and thrive. And the way they do this is through virulence factors. Virulence factors give the ability to the bacteria to survive and thrive and also invade the host. When they invade the host, this is what causes diseases. One of the aspects of virulence is called adherence factors. When you speak about adherence factors, this is the ability of the bacteria to actually colonize on mucosal membranes of mammals. They do this by these little pili, which are little hair-like fibers that attach to the cell. Another way that bacteria survive is by releasing toxins. There are two different types of toxins. One is called an endotoxin, and the other one is called exotoxin. When we use the word toxin, we are talking about a substance that the bacteria secretes that could alter the normal metabolism of host cells, causing disease. An endotoxin is present in the outer membrane of a gram-negative bacteria and is very toxic. Exotoxins are protein-like substances that are released from bacteria. Most of the exotoxins are caused by gram-positive bacteria, but some gram-negative bacteria also have exotoxins. Some examples of exotoxins are cholera, anthrax, tetanus, diphtheria, botulism, and pertussis. All of this is exotoxins. When we think about endotoxins, it is part of the wall of the gram-negative bacteria, and a lot of times it causes fever and inflammation. When you think of exotoxins, it is secreted by the bacteria and actually inhibits the immune response. Other ways bacteria survive is by releasing destructive enzymes that break down cell walls of host. Another way of it working is by immune modulators. These are special chemicals that break down the immune system of the host cell. 
all of this can really wreak havoc on the body, and this is how bacteria survive, by their virulence factors. The more virulence factors that bacteria has, the greater likelihood it can survive under adverse conditions. Let's start talking about certain bacteria that we see in the hospital. The first one we're going to talk about is Staphylococcus aureus. This is a very common infection that approximately 30% of the people carry in their noses. Most of the time, a staph infection doesn't cause any harm because our immune system is really strong. But if our immune system gets weakened, we can end up getting sepsis, we could get pneumonia, we could get endocarditis, we could also get osteomyelitis. Since staph infections are very common on the skin, there are certain types of skin disorders that occur. For example, boils. These are the most common type of staph infections, which is basically a pocket of pus in a hair follicle. Another one is cellulitis. Cellulitis is an infection of deeper layers of the skin, and it causes redness and swellness in the area. It also can create ulcers that ooze discharge. Let's talk a little bit more about Staphylococcus aureus. 20% or 25% of the people in the world are colonized with a staph infection. But because our immune system is very strong, we don't get sick. But as we get older, or if we, God forbid, get cancer or HIV, our immunity is not at its best no more. And what this can cause is these colonized infections in our body could come forward. Staphylococcus aureus infects not only superficial tissue, but sometimes deep tissue. It also works by toxin-mediated diseases. When you speak about toxins, we mentioned that before about endotoxins and exotoxins. For example, Staphylococcus aureus can give you food poison. It could also give you toxic shock syndrome. And another very bad thing is called scalded skin syndrome. What makes these bacteria very strong is their virulence factors. In particular, with a staph infection, they release toxins, they release enzymes, and they also release immune modulators, which reduces the immune system of the host cell. The old saying that one picture is worth a thousand words is clearly displayed here. On the left, you see a patient who has toxic shock syndrome. And on the right, you have scalded skin syndrome. Both of these conditions are caused by staphylococcus infections. Both are topical and both can wreak havoc in your body. Other types of infections that are caused by staphylococcus aureus are sepsis. Many times a patient will come in for a wound sore and as a result, it could work its way down into the bloodstream and then the patient can become septic. Another big problem today, especially with the infants, is staphylococcal pneumonia. This is happening at an alarming rate. Early recognition and prompt treatment can reduce the high mortality rate in this age group. There's a high likely that you have this type of pneumonia when you don't respond to normal antibiotics. And typically, this happens in the lower respiratory tract. Staphylococcal endocarditis is becoming more commonplace these days. Many patients end up getting a heart valve replacement. And a lot of times when this happens, they end up getting a staphylococcal infection that impacts the valves of the heart. Recognizing this early is the best therapy. And finally, we have osteomyelitis. This is a bone infection that can happen when you have a wound that clearly works its way down into the bloodstream and works its way into the bone. Another very bad condition, all caused by the staphylococcal bacteria. Another type of hospital-acquired infection is called E. coli. E. coli is a gram-negative bacteria that normally colonizes the GI tract. E. coli is rod-shaped and commonly indwells in the intestinal tract of ward-blooded animals. 
and typically it takes about 20 minutes to reproduce. A vast majority of E. coli strains are harmless and actually offer some kind of benefit to the body, for example, in producing vitamin K2 and inhibiting colonization of pathogenic bacteria. Normally, our gut has plenty of E. coli and it's very normal, but there's been studies showing that E. coli can cause some very severe hospital-acquired urinary tract infections. Research indicates that nosocomial urinary tract infection caused by E. coli differ from community-acquired strains in their virulent strains. In addition to urinary tract infections, certain types of strains can cause gastroenteritis, it could cause neonatal meningitis, hemorrhagic colitis, and pneumonia. So we really got to consider the factors that E. coli is a very bad bug. As mentioned in the previous slide, E. coli is responsible for a number of diseases. Here is a listing of diseases that E. coli causes. Urinary tract infections, sepsis, pneumonia, neonatal meningitis, gastroenteritis. How is E. coli such a strong bug? Because it has many different virulence factors. For example, endotoxins, capsules, adhesion factors are all methods of its survival. And there are specialized virulence factors that are seen in cases of urinary tract infections and gastroenteritis in resistant organisms. VRE, or vancomycin-resistant enterococci, are a type of species of bacteria that has been pretty commonplace in most hospitals. Enterococci are a type of bacteria that is found normally in the person's intestinal tract and genital tracts of women. As long as it stays in the intestinal tract or genital tract, they don't usually cause a problem. This is known as being colonized rather than infected. The problem occurs when you get an infection with this type of bacteria. Antibiotics are heaven sent. They can treat many different types of pathogenic bacteria. And in particular, vancomycin is an antibiotic that has been around for over 50 years. Uh, this type of antibiotic has been great for MRSA infections and other different infections such as C. diff. But in recent years, these bacteria have found a way to become resistant to this vancomycin. And now there's not many different bio antibiotics that can treat the patient. Another very bad bug out there is called vancomycin resistant endococci, or basically VRE. VRE is a type of bacteria that is resistant to most antibiotics. And in particular, it's resistant to vancomycin, which is a very powerful antibiotic. There are approximately 17 different species of this particular bug, and most of them are resistant to vancomycin. This type of bacteria is normally found in the intestinal tract and the genital tracts of females. As long as the... As long as the body is able to fight off any kind of infections, this is a good thing. This is known as being colonized rather than infected. Vancomycin is an antibiotic that has been around for more than 50 years. It was originally developed to fight off MRSA infections, and also it worked very well for C. diff infections. But over the years, some strains of bacteria have become very aggressive, and now they have become resistant to vancomycin. Vancomycin can be transmitted from one person to another or from one object to another, such as a stethoscope or mechanical ventilation. 
great care has to be taken to reduce the spread of this infection. This infection has been caused by the overuse of antibiotics. The overuse of antibiotics is a real problem and we're going to speak to that a little bit later in this presentation. The topic of infectious disease would not be complete without a talk about enterococci. These are the second leading causes of hospital acquired infections worldwide. Most of the time, patients who are admitted from a nursing home or a long-term vent facility are colonized with this type of bacteria. It accounts for over 20 to 30% of all infections in the United States. It's a gram-positive organism and is normally found in the normal flora of the female genital tract and the GI tract of people. Most of the time, it's involved with blood-borne pathogens, such as urinary tract infections, and also surgical site procedures end up getting infected with this type of bacteria. It has many different virulence factors, such as extracellular proteins, adhesion factors, hemolysins, and all different types of mechanisms to make this bacteria survive. Actually, this is the bacteria involved with VRE, as we spoke about in the last slide. Okay, let's now talk about C. diff. C. diff is a nosocomial pathogen that really causes severe diarrhea while in the hospital. Typically, patients who have been in the hospital for a long period of time are at greater risk of being in contact with C. diff. It's a gram-negative bacteria, and actually it's spore-forming. What that means, it has an outer coating that makes this bacteria sit around for long periods of time on inanimate objects, such as bed rails, ventilators, doorknobs, stethoscopes. So... In respect, this is a very contagious bacteria. Normally, it is part of our normal flora for our GI tract, but when it overtakes our immune system, it could cause all kinds of diseases. In particular, it creates a disease called colitis, which occurs in 15 to 25 percent of the cases. C. diff can be treated with some very strong antibiotics such as vancomycin. When we speak about modes of transmission, we mean how does the actual bacteria get transmitted from one person to another or from one object to a person. There are two types of transmission. There is person to person and is also at the same time indirect transmission that occurs with objects such as stethoscopes, bed rails, bedpans, ventilators, doorknobs, and so on. When we talk about Staphylococcus aureus, that's typically a topical infection on a patient's skin. So skin-to-skin -skin contact can really cause the organism to be transferred from one item to another. It could also stay on door handles, benches, towels, and so on. E. coli is again transmitted from person to person, and mostly important, it loves moist conditions. So contaminated water and food, bed sheets, soiled bed sheets in particular, can be a great way of transferring this organism from one person to another. VRE transmission occurs when a patient has diarrhea. When this organism touches a surface, it could stay on that particular surface for weeks. For example, at our hospital, we had a patient who had a VRE and our environmental services team came in and cleaned the room. They scrubbed the walls, they scrubbed the curtains, they scrubbed the ventilator, they scrubbed the stethoscopes, everything was scrubbed. The room was Lysol fresh. Then our microbiology team came in with a Petri dish and did swabs of all the different areas. And would you believe it? VRE was attached to most of the areas that were swabbed. So you really got to be careful. Klebsiella pneumonia is normally transmitted from person-to-person -person contact. For example, 
healthcare workers who do not wash their hands can touch another object or another person and this type of bacteria could be transferred to them. Also, ventilators, catheters, exposed wounds are other great sources of infection. Many of these patients have loose stool. As a result of that, bed sheets and handrails and everything like that can be contaminated. Pseudomonas is a common infection in a hospital and really many cases of ventilator associated pneumonia have occurred from it. Basically, this type of bacteria loves humidity. So anything with humidity, especially heated humidity, can be a source of infection. Common reservoirs are breast pumps, incubators, sinks, and so on. I remember a case in the NICU where many of the babies came down with a pseudomonas infection and they thought it was the ventilator that was doing it with the heated humidification. It turns out that the incubators had a heated wick system that obtained a lot of moisture and also was colonized with pseudomonas. Hi Terry, this is Al. We're going to begin this lecture and we're going to start with our um, ethics and then go to safety and then go to infection control. All right, Terry, so I'm done jerking off now. So now I, I feel better and now we're going to, we're going to you know, finish the rest of the lecture. When you think about antibiotic resistant nosocomial pathogens, certain bugs come to mind. For example, MRSA, VRE, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, and C. diff have now shown resistance to bacteria. 50 to 60 percent of all hospital acquired infections are caused by resistant pathogens. Mostly, the reason for this is the improper use of antibiotics. Since the 1940s, antibiotics have been used to treat people with infectious disease caused by bacteria. These medications greatly reduce illness and death from such conditions as tuberculosis and pneumonia. However, certain antibiotics have been so wildly used for so long that now the diseases become resistant to them and the treatment plans are less effective. Antibiotic resistance occurs when the medication loses its ability to kill bacteria. As a result, the organism grows and causes infection. Some bacteria are naturally resistant to certain types of antibiotics, but most of them become resistant through natural genetic mutation or by acquiring resistance genes from other bacteria. Staphylococcus aureus was first discovered around the 1880s, and during that time, most of the infections caused by this particular bacteria for skin infections. There were more serious forms of staph infections throughout the years, such as bacterial pneumonia and sepsis, which both can be fatal. In the 1940s, the medical treatment for a staph infection was penicillin, and penicillin was the wonder drug of its time. But because of its misuse and overuse, the bacteria soon developed a resistance to that type of medication, such as penicillin. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, a staph infection actually developed resistance to penicillin and they created a new medication from penicillin called methicillin, which was used to kill staph infections. Again, in the 1960s, methicillin became ineffective for killing staph infections. The first case of MRSA in the United States was in 1968, and it's shown that this particular bug could not be killed by many antibiotics such as penicillin, amoxicillin, oxacillin, methicillin, and so many others. Soon it became resistant to vancomycin, and this has become a really major problem for healthcare today. The term beta-lactamase antibiotics speaks to antibiotics that work like penicillin. Staphylococcal bacteria have a natural enzyme which really makes penicillin ineffective. At this point, beta-lactam antibiotics are ineffective for MRSA, 
and MRSA has a high mortality rate in hospitals. VRE, or vancomycin-resistant enterococci, are bacteria that are resistant to many different forms of antibiotics. For example, penicillin, ampicillin, aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, fluoroquinolones are all ineffective against this medication. The reason why these particular species do so well is because they are genetically predisposed to be resistant. They contain two genes called the Van A and Van B genes. These genes have been shown to be very effective on killing antimicrobials that are trying to invade the cell. Another reason why they do so well is because they have these little snippets of genetic material called plasmids. These plasmids can be transferred from one bacteria to another, and then they pick up the same resistance as the original bacteria. Currently, the treatment pattern for treating these disorders is to use a variety of different antimicrobials instead of just using one. Another resistant bacteria is Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas has become a real problem in a hospital where many of the patients who have ventilator-associated pneumonia end up being colonized by Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas loves moisture. So anytime you see heated humidifiers or isolates for babies, Pseudomonas should come to your mind. Pseudomonas works in two different ways of becoming resistant. Number one, it restricts uptake of drugs. And number two, it modifies the target sites for antibiotics on the cell membrane. There are many different classes of medications that don't work very well with infections with Pseudomonas. For example, cephalosporins, macrocytes. To treat an infection for a patient who is colonized by Pseudomonas, many of the normal antibiotics are ineffective. For example, tetracyclines and fluoroquinolones are now ineffective to treat Pseudomonas infections. The best therapy is to do a combination of two antimicrobials, such as aminoglycosides and cephalosporins. They seem to work. Klebsiella pneumonia generally occurs in patients who are immunocompromised and are elderly. It is a common ventilator-associated pneumonia that you will find in most hospitals. Klebsiella pneumonia normally can cause an infection in the lungs and can cause hemorrhagic necrosis and cavity formation. The organism is a gram-negative bacilli and it's very difficult to treat. Klebsiella pneumonia is resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics. Beta-lactam antibiotics are the penicillin family. It is also resistant to third and fourth generation cephalosporins and that can be a real problem because there's not many drugs left to treat it. The current treatment program for Klebsiella pneumonia is a combination therapy of aminoglycosides and imipenem. C. diff is a bacteria that is spread by microscopic spores. The bacteria cause inflammation of the gut or colon, or in other words, colitis. This can lead to moderate to severe diarrhea and sometimes sepsis. The reason C. diff is a real problem today is because of the increased use of broad-spectrum antibiotics. What that does, it kills the normal flora of bacteria that exist in our colon. This causes severe diarrhea and inflammation. The best way you can handle this is by the proper use of antibiotics. The treatment for C. diff, especially resistive C. diff, is with vancomycin and great hand washing techniques. One of the best ways of controlling nosocomial infections is to determine what kind of antimicrobials work best on these particular bacteria. The way this is done is that the laboratory collects specimens of bacteria and then determines what kind of antimicrobials work to kill them and which kind are resistant. When you start getting resistant organisms, they are very difficult to treat and the amount of antimicrobials available to treat them is very limited. Another interesting fact is that 
every hospital has different variants of different types of organisms in it. For example, at one hospital, you may have ventilator-associated pneumonia, and the most common bacteria there is a Cenobac, where another hospital has ventilator-associated pneumonia, and the most common bacteria is Pseudomonas. The problem with this is that you can't share information between hospitals and treatment plans because they have different types of bacteria. Then you must consider that many hospitals do not want to share what kind of cases of infection they have because they don't want to put their dirty laundry out there. This doesn't help the situation for patients. When you're controlling nosocomial infections, one of the most important things you need to know is what type of organism is involved with this particular infection. The good news is that most infectious organisms are heterogeneous. In other words, they are much different from each other. One could be rod-shaped, one could be circular, and gram staining makes it very easy to determine what type of bacteria it is. One of the best things hospitals can do is to compare infection rates from one to another. When two different hospitals share their infection rates and one is really doing much better than another, maybe they can share this information with the other facility and they could put into practices that would reduce the number of infections. A big problem we have today is that many of the patients who are admitted from nursing homes are colonized with gram-negative bacteria and many of these bacteria are resistive in nature. This brings to the point that we really got to manage the patients who come into our hospital and determine whether they have any kind of pre-existing infection. At my old hospital, we used to treat every patient who came into the hospital as infected, then rule out if they had an infection or not. Every hospital is obligated to develop an infection control program. And one of the first places to start is guidelines for sterilization and disinfection in the hospital. In the United States, approximately 46 million surgical procedures are reported every year, and 5 million of them are gastrointestinal endoscopies. Each of these procedures means that a medical device comes in contact with the patient's tissue. And this is a great way for infections to be spread from one person to another. Disinfection and sterilization techniques are essential for ensuring that medical and surgical equipment does not transmit infectious pathogens to different patients. Another great consideration is catheter-associated urinary tract infections are widely recognized as the most common healthcare-associated infection in the acute care hospital setting. Microbial colonization occurs within five to seven days of catheter placement and is frequently associated with the development of a bacterial biofilm that causes the infection. As a result, different policies must be in place on exactly how long the catheter is in place and also when to remove it. Each hospital has the responsibility to take care of this process. You need to work with your infection control department to develop protocols and policies that will prevent the spread of infections and the education to healthcare workers. Another important aspect is surveillance of nosocomial infections and to look at outbreaks that have occurred. You need to look at retrospective data and see what exactly went on and sometimes a root cause analysis is a great way of doing it. The CDC actually offers many different methods to help you with this process. And finally, the best thing you could do is to train your staff. Infection control education is imperative to keep away those type of bugs. Infection control education is paramount. Each healthcare worker should understand the risk involved with infections and the ways to prevent it. Here we are. We're getting very close to the end of this presentation. One of the last slides I'll be talking about is surveillance and nosocomial infections. One of the best ways to control infections is to collect data. You need to look at your past infection rates, analyze it, see what went wrong, 
and then do something about it. This has to be ongoing and a very systematic way of collecting data and analyzing the data. Your medical staff need to look at what practices they are putting in place to control certain types of infections and see what works. And also another way of doing it is look at clusters. In other words, groups of breakouts in certain ICUs or certain patient care areas and then evaluate exactly what went wrong. Evidence has shown that surveillance systems leads to better infection control practices and less disease spreading throughout the hospital. Sometimes infection control practitioners are seated in the ICU and viewing who's washing their hands and who's not, who's gowning up and who's not. All of these practices have been shown to reduce the spread of infection. In summary, there are many different things we can do to prevent the spread of infections in the hospital so that patients don't get these nosocomial infections. No matter what we do, people are going to still get hospital-acquired infections. Even with the best antibiotics that we have out there, they're still going to get it. Basically, the best thing we could do is control the outbreak of infections because in today's environment, the cost of healthcare has really skyrocketed. And to control costs, we really need to be efficient in the care we give to the patient, and we need to make sure that we don't introduce any kind of pathogens into their life. Each hospital has the responsibility to develop infection control practices that will reduce the spread of infection. Also, the doctors have a big part in this in that they should be prudent in the use of antibiotics for patients. That is the main reason why there are so many resistant organisms out there is because of the improper use of antibiotics by physicians. Hospitals that manage their infections and also do root cause analysis are some of the best performers in the country. And these best practices should be shared with other hospitals. Infections are not going away. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, these are the references that I put together for the topic that I just offered.